roll tape. Um, that's the book, I believe. Is that what you guys found in the bookstore? Um, if you can get it used, by all means do so. Uh, I really like this. I understand they're going to discontinue it, which I think is stupid. It's the student value edition, which means it's not absurdly expensive. And it's got almost everything else that the full, uh, full version of this book had, except that was four color. This is two color, red and shades of black. Um, not quite as many problems, but you know how many problems are in these books. We couldn't possibly do them all anyway. So I really like to use this book because it saves you a bunch of money. And it's light and small and easy to carry. So uh, get it if you can. Um, I might have a spare to loan until you do get one if you're just looking for it and wait for it to come out on eBay or something and you're trying to beat somebody in Claremont. What? Or half.com. Twelve, <laughs> Twelve bucks? Twelve bucks. Shh, that's cheap at twice the price. That's a little bit better. Did anybody get it new? What was it? No? It was still under something new. Yeah, it's it's I, it's embarrassing. I, I'm, I'm ashamed of what the publishers do with these books, but I don't have any choice. Well, I do. Um, you know, I could I could write my own, but I don't want to. <laughs> if I wanted to write my own, I would want to sell them for 150 bucks. <laughs> so, so uh, we won't we won't worry about that. All right. Uh, so this class statics is a part of what's generally called mechanics. And uh, you know, it has to do with the, the physical nature of what things do. In fact, that's what we did in Physics 1, was, was mechanics for the most part. Um, this will be, uh, in part, uh, just an amplification of some of the stuff we did in Physics 1. Um, there's, uh, yeah, well, of course we're going to go over some new things, but what we're mostly going to do that's new is do old stuff in new ways so we can do better problems, we can do bigger problems, um, more realistic problems, because that's all you're really doing here in your engineering career is stepping towards realism. Uh, and you can't jump right there because realism is, is so complex and so involved and that's why it takes a couple of years to work up towards it. That's, that's where we're going. Uh, there's a couple parts to mechanics that you're going to come across in the next uh, couple of years. This one, where we are now, is uh, variously called statics. Probably in the spring, though uh, we'll talk about it later because I let the students choose what we do in the spring, but probably in the spring we'll do the second one that's called dynamics. Those two together kind of make a, a super advanced physics one. It's like a, a physics one is sort of mechanics light, and now we're going to do mechanics heavier but not real heavy because you're still working towards that. What you're really going to need to do a lot of these things when you get to them is you're going to need differential equations. And that's coming up for most of you next term, right, as your, as your fourth math course. Uh, other parts to this, um, there's also fluid mechanics. Um, are you, have you guys done physics two? Some of you have, some of you haven't. Well, in physics two, uh, that was also split into fluid statics and fluid dynamics, but uh, fluid mechanics is, and they're all very closely related. And uh, then there's other parts in here. Uh, strength of materials comes out of this one. Um, in fact, in some schools, they just combine those into one four hour class instead of the way we do it as the two three hour classes. Some schools combine statics and dynamics as one four-hour course instead of the way we do it as two three-hour courses. So we actually have three three-hour courses for those three classes where some schools you take two of them uh, for just eight credit hours. So that's part of what makes transferring trouble and why we always 
try to talk to the schools ahead of time to get those articulation agreements just to smooth this stuff out so they know what we're doing, we know what they're doing, and we know if we need to make a change sometimes. But for the most part, that's that's where we are. All right, the the difference between statics and dynamics, especially since you've already done some of both in physics one, statics, we're going to sum all the forces acting on an object, which of course, if you remember, will tell us how an object of a particular mass will accelerate, except in this class, in statics, there is no acceleration. We will not look at anything that can accelerate in this class. So the sum of the forces will always come to zero. And if you remember from physics one, uh, that's what we did in the last week or two. We did a little bit of statics and equilibrium type stuff. Um, technically, of course, Since the acceleration is the time rate of change of the velocity, if the acceleration is zero, then the velocity is nope. I heard zero. That's not right. Constant. So we're only going to look at things that move with constant velocity. However, we're going to be even more specific. We're going to actually pick that constant for almost every single problem, and that constant itself will be zero. So we're going to set that as a condition of this class. Everything we look at in this class must have constant velocity. Almost everything in this class will have zero velocity as the constant. One of our favorite constants. We've got there's a couple constants that you really like, and that's one of them. That's a that's a favorite constant because it does it does make things uh, simpler. So most of what we're going to be doing here is summing the forces. However, we won't know all the forces. We'll set that sum equal to zero. It'll allow us to find all the forces. So we're going to look at problems with. Some of the forces unknown, and use our statics. Uh, this is called equilibrium. Our static equilibrium. We're going to set that condition. We're going to force that condition on the problem, and use that to find the unknowns in the problem. Uh, it may sound like this is really kind of silly. I mean, what does this really have to do with the real world? But it has an awful lot to do with the real world because we're going to look at structures and bridges and trusses and those kind of things that you don't want to accelerate. Not while you're anywhere near them, I don't think. It's catastrophic when a bridge accelerates. So this this is very important to, to well, to what is very important to us right now, that we're reasonably confident the building we're in will not accelerate at least for the next bit of time that we're here. Bill's looking at the clock going, oh no, now I'm getting nervous. Does Manning know something I don't know? Uh. So it, it seems like, like uh, gee whiz, you're, just, you're throwing away a whole bunch of the world, but, but we're not. You, know, you can make a huge, whole, satisfying career as an engineer who does nothing more than sums of forces and goes zero. That's what structural engineers do civil engineers and the bridges they design and the overpasses and the walkways and all those things. You don't want your name in the news as the engineer who designed a bridge that accelerated. So uh, we're going to spend a lot of time. We've, this isn't all. We've got other things to do because we'll, we'll see there's some problems where the force is sum to zero, but the object still accelerates and we still don't want to be on it. So we'll have more to do, but we'll get to that in a little bit. And then uh, dynamics is the situation where, in simplified terms, the forces don't sum to zero, and so there is some residual acceleration. Either we want to 
determine what that acceleration is, because we know what the forces are, or we want to guarantee a particular acceleration, so we need to know what the forces are. Either way, it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, this is a little bit of a simplification because there are other tools we need to apply here where the forces could sum to zero, but the uh, other the other things we have coming in here don't. Um, in, in our case, everything's going to sum to zero in this class because we don't want anything to accelerate. And for the most part, we don't even want it to move. So that's uh, the condition of static equilibrium. And it's, it's uh, sacred to the work we're doing here this semester. Everything we do in this class is, is uh, a condition of static equilibrium. So violate that at your own risk. OK, so let's, uh, let's uh, well, it's not even a review problem. This is so simple. But it allows me to focus now a little bit on some of the things we need to pay attention to as we get into more complex problems here. So we might have a problem uh, something like this. Where we have some mass hanging from a support wire of some kind. And we know that it can hold, it can resist a tension of 1200 newtons and you want to find out what mass then can we put on that. If you put on too much mass it's not going to be able to hold all that and then the mass will accelerate. Now we're not going to be that specific in all these problems where we say uh, how much mass can we put on there so that it doesn't accelerate. You have to understand that we're working in the conditions of static equilibrium. So the problem is one like this. You have a 1,200 Newton wire. How much mass can you put on it safely? You understand that it's asking you to preserve static equilibrium as you solve the problem. The, uh, the Probably the number one tool we need in here, and if you were a little crummy with this, in physics one, you better get better at this now, and that's the use of free body diagrams. We're going to need to do those a lot in here. There are very few problems you can do without a free body diagram. And I say that uh, in modesty because there are very few of these problems I can do without free body diagrams. Uh, and, and I may not necessarily be brighter than you, but I'm certainly more experienced in this. And if I still need free body diagrams for these problems, I'll bet you you do too. So it's the, think back to the physics one, you know, I spent a lot of time going over what kind of forces we're going to see in these classes. Uh, naturally, we've got the force in a wire of some kind in this problem. It's part of it there. Um, you got to figure the mass. Well, I haven't said that this is on Earth, but uh, again, that's one of those things you're going to have to understand as part of the problem, even if it's not specifically stated as part of the problem. So, the one of the questions always becomes, what do you draw the free body diagram of? And some of the problems are very obvious, and some not so obvious. And sometimes in some of these problems. We're going to need several free body diagrams of different parts of it. When we look at the uh, forces in uh, some of the bridges and trusses we're going to look at, we're going to need a couple free body diagrams to finish the problem. One won't do it. One will only get us started on it. Then to finish the problem, we're going to need some other free body diagrams. So you have, you have to make the decision several times. What do I make the free body diagram of? And then how do I make that free body diagram? Uh, hopefully it's kind of obvious in this one, we don't want the mass to accelerate because the only way it's going to do that is if the cord breaks. And the problem stated, what mass can this cord safely support? That implies that we don't want this thing to accelerate. We want to stay where it is. So that, in this example, might be a good place to start. So of course, nice, simple, uh, 
illustration of some kind to represent the object that we're trying to keep from accelerating. And uh, like I said, when we get to more complicated things, a bridge, well, we don't want the bridge to accelerate, but we also don't want any part of the bridge to accelerate. So we're going to have to do each part as well as the bridge as a whole to make sure it doesn't accelerate. So all those parts, pieces come into it. To, uh, to um, make sure it doesn't accelerate, we're going to have to apply the one tool we have, which is that the forces sum to zero. In a little bit, we'll get another tool to help us with this static equilibrium, and that'll be it. That'll be the whole class. In another week or two, we get the second tool, and that's it. We're all done. You, you can. You can take the rest of the semester off and just show up to the final. I mean, I'll be here and keep taping and stuff, but just because I, I, it's awesome to be on camera. Um, so uh, that's the only tool we've got. We've got to sum the forces, but the same thing that applied in Physics 1 applies here, and it's going to apply in dynamics and strength of materials when you get there. You've got to have all of the pertinent forces. If you're missing any, you're doing a different problem. And it's going to be very difficult to assure static equilibrium, to assure that the forces sum to zero if you're missing a couple of the forces. You've got to have them all. They've all got to be there. So that's uh, we spent some time on that in Physics 1, and we're going to keep spending some time on it here, and we'll redo it in Physics. I mean, in dynamics and strength of materials, you've got to know what all the forces are on the object. For example, give me one. What what'd you look at him for? <laughs> to see if he'd have the answer even though he doesn't have a hat on? Okay, let's come back. Any, any forces on? Because right now, we're okay. That thing's not going to accelerate right now. <laughs> so I guess we're done. Except the problem asks what mass can we put on there, and we haven't answered that yet. However, according to the free body diagram, we have static equilibrium. Yeah. Well, uh, we're, we expect that uh, we need to put on as much mass as we can to get up to there's a tensile force in that cord of 1200 newtons. We know what kind of forces cords exert. Remember that from physics one? What do, what do uh, chains, cables, ropes, strings, cords, okay, all those, all those things in your bedroom, any of those things, what kind of forces do those exert? You do. You kind of blush, so I don't know what's in your bedroom. You just laugh. So, uh, what? Again, what kind of forces do they exert? They can only pull. You can't push with a chain. Can't push with a string. You're welcome to try for extra credit. Uh, they can only pull, and they do so in their own direction. So we can put that down as a known force because that's actually what limits the problem. If we didn't have some limit on the cord, we could put any mass on there and we wouldn't have to ask this question. But we need to ask the question, how much mass can we put here so that the cord safely supports it? So there's, there's the limit on there, as much a limit as the force is summing to zero. Now, as uh, very often in these problems, especially the, the simpler ones we're starting with, you can look at these and tell this thing's going to accelerate if I don't do something about it quick. So there must be other forces. If you can look at a problem and say, that's not going to be an equilibrium. It's going to take off if I don't jump in here and rescue the situation. So there must be other forces because there couldn't possibly be an equilibrium. And of course, that other force is the force of gravity, weight, the weight of the object, 
And in fact, that's where the mass will come into it. Now, uh, in fact, if it wasn't for that mass, we wouldn't have this tension in there uh, that we've had in the problem. So, so uh, uh, it's not like, uh, uh, you know, these things cause each other. This weight causes that tension, that tension resists that weight. So they, they all go together. The thing, the problem's not ready until you got it done. And that's when you've got all the forces, all the pertinent forces in the problem up on the free body diagram. And then you can safely do the sum of the forces equal zero. What do I mean by all the pertinent forces? Well, yeah, there, there are other forces in the problem. Something has got to make sure that the cable itself doesn't accelerate. Because it could be that the cable accelerates, the object accelerates, but the cable didn't fail. So uh, our limit would be uh, not of much use, that limit of 1,200 newtons in the cable. Uh, so there's got to be something else going on at the other end. And of course, that's... Uh, well, there's the, the ceiling, and now the cable is pulling down, because that's all cables can do. They can only pull. So we've got that situation. In terms of the forces in that diagram, that thing's not in equilibrium yet either. However, that's not what the problem asked. The problem did not ask, can the... Ceiling support a an object hanging from this cable. Can the whatever connection the cable makes with the ceiling support it? But if you were a structural engineer of some kind, you've got to look at all those things because any one of these points could be a failure point. But for these problems and the way they're stated and the use of the free body diagram. This object is free from the other objects. The question did not ask about the ceiling or the connection there. So our diagram is free of that. That's what the free and free body diagram means. We don't need that part because it wasn't part of the problem. But God, if you're an engineer on this project, yeah, you've got to check that too. You've got to check that the ceiling can hold this. You've got to check that however you connect to the ceiling, you know, if you put a cable over and put on one of those little turnbuckles, you've got to make sure that all holds. But it just wasn't part of the problem. It's still very true that that has to be in equilibrium too, but it's, not, it's just not part of our problem. So there's other forces in the problem, but they're not pertinent. There were forces on the ceiling, but it wasn't pertinent to the question. But there are other forces that aren't pertinent, that because they're not pertinent, we leave them out. Well, there's, there's some way that this cable is connected to the mass, but that the problem didn't ask about the connection itself. Uh, we'll look at some of that in strength of materials next term. Um, it could be that your job is such that you do need to very much worry about the connections, the simple connectors that uh, are part of your design. But in this problem, we're looking at, at a more macroscopic view of things. We're assuming that the cable is connected safely to the mass, and that's not going to be the failure point. The failure is somewhere in the cable itself, and we want to prevent that by designing at the limit. There's also intermolecular forces. You know, that mass is made up of little molecules and they're all sucking on each other and pulling and yanking and bouncing around and all the, none of those things matter. Those are all internal forces. For every one of those in one direction, there's one equal and opposite in the other direction, so they cancel anyway. So it's not like we're making some terrible simplification by saying we don't need to look at the intermolecular forces. But you might, if that's part of the connection at the top of the mass, where you need to know the breaking strength, because the breaking strength is when the molecules can't hold on to each other anymore. We'll look at that in the next term of strength of materials, but we don't need to look at it now. So keep these things simple. Don't overdraw them. Don't 
don't make a big deal about all the little pictures. Um, but then, once you've got all the forces there, then your job is to satisfy this condition. And this is a, a condition we're applying on the problem. We're saying that we do not want that to accelerate. And the, the problem as David would have said, what mass can safely be held by this, this cable? That's saying you imply this condition of static equilibrium. Make sure all the forces sum to zero. When you get to that point, then your problem is, is a very typical problem for undergraduates in engineering. You've got to have enough equations for the number of unknowns. In this case, well, the weight was unknown, but that's not what was asked. We asked for the mass. But you know how weight and mass are related, I hope. But you're not going to share it with us? Of course, W equals mg. Now, uh, we're not going to take that as an equation. If it's asked for the mass and we're dealing with the weight, then let's just keep things straightforward. If, if it asks for the mass, we have the weight, which we will have when we solve the problem. You probably already solved it in your heads. Uh, don't treat that as an unknown. Just W equals mg is so obvious that we don't need to worry about whether m is asked for or w is asked for. If we know one, we know the other automatically. Just to keep things simple and moving. We don't have, just like we don't need to worry about the connection with the roof. It's just, it's just a, a distraction. Uh, w equals mg, always. The only thing that can change a little bit is what is g. If we go to different planets or even different places on the Earth, g can change. But, you know, for the most part, we deal with that as uh, uh, 9.81 meters per second squared for our uh, SI type units. So then we could solve that problem. Um, Summing the force is equal to zero. Well, uh, it's a vector, so we're going to have to treat it like a vector. But there's only up and down problems, so um, we don't need to deal with any horizontal problems, because uh, forces, because there aren't any. So again, just keep it simple. Don't write down the sum of the forces in the x direction is zero, and then put zero equals zero. You're just wasting your time and mine. There are no horizontal problems or forces, so let's not even worry about it again. Um, now, in this class, since all of the forces sum to zero, then I find it a lot easier to then say all of the up forces must equal all of the down forces uh, in magnitude. Because when you're saying up and down and put them on one side or the other, you're already taking care of direction. So it's pretty easy to say all the up forces equal all the down forces. You don't have to do it this way. You can sum them uh, all on one side and know they all have to equal zero. Uh, when I write it out, it shows why I think this is an easier way to do it. Uh, up forces, let's see, that's T, and down forces, that's W. Remember, M is not a force. The mass is not a force. It's the weight that's the force. So we got T equals W. If you did it in this way and sum all the forces and then force that sum to be zero, you'd write it as, well, let's see. Let's say up is positive. So the W is negative. And when we sum those two together, they've got to be zero. Notice there's no difference between those two things. Algebraically, they're exactly the same, are they not? The reason I like this, just saying all the up forces equal to all the down forces, is for two reasons. One, it makes it a lot easier to go through a problem and not skip any or 
or screw them up somehow. It's just very easy to look at a problem. You only have to look at half the problem because only half the problem can have up arrows. The other half's got to have down arrows. So you only have to look at half the problem. You're just less likely to make a mistake. You don't want to miss any of the forces in this sum or you're doing the wrong problem. But the main reason I like this, there's no negative signs. There's absolutely no question whether a force should be negative or not. It, it just doesn't even come up. Algebraically, they're exactly the same. I don't care which one you do. I won't count off if you do that, even though I like this, because they're the same. I just think my years of teaching this, and this is probably the 12th time or something I've taught this course, I think, I've just found that this is so much easier. All the up forces equal all the down forces. If we have horizontal forces, we say all the left forces equals all the right forces. It just so easy. No minus signs. Minus signs are what it'll do. That's what's going to be on my tombstone. Of finally, finally, he missed the minus sign, and here he rests. Thirty-nine years of age. So that what's that mean? Next year. I better be careful with my minus signs. Because I, I, I don't want to come to your memorial service. I don't want you to come to mine. Well, yeah, I do. I want you to come to mine. You're all invited. Hopefully for you, mine's first. Can I dress up as the river? You, you, you will, you're that anyway, Adam. All right, so uh, algebraically the same. I like this. This is the way I'll do them with the board. It's just so much simpler for a small brain like mine that I like to do that because I don't like to have anything that leads to mistakes. Um, and then we can use that to solve for the mass. Remember, we don't we just take that as a given. Uh, we don't have to treat that as, as an unknown. You don't have to say, oh, I don't know W or M. I need two equations. Just that just that's given. So we're we're okay here. Uh, hopefully. And then that can lead to the mass, which is, have we got it yet? What? I got 122 kilograms. Now, the question, you know, they say, uh, what mass can safely be supported? Well, technically, then the answer is any mass equal to or less than 122 but again you know let's not overdo these things let's just keep it simple address the, the physics that we're talking about here and keep moving with it um, so you don't have to say the mass is less but sometimes you have to pay attention to these because sometimes you need a greater mass than the one that's in the problem because it's a different type of problem. Certain masses, it'd be what's the minimum mass that can safely stabilize this structure? Uh, so we do have to pay attention to them some. Also, uh, we don't really deal with it here in this class, but we will in strength of materials. This is not the mass you'd want to hang on here because that puts you right at the very limit which means if you bought from the vendor a 1200 Newton cable, but he screwed up the manufacturing a little bit and it's really a, a 1150 Newton cable, you put 122 kilograms on it, it's gonna break. And so you never want to design right to the limit in real engineering problems because you're too, you have no margin for the fact that everything is a little bit different. When these guys build these cables, and they say 1,200 newtons, well, that might be a statistical spread. Most of them are 1,200 newtons. Some of them are 1,400 newtons. Some of them are 1,000 newtons. But most of them are 1,200 newtons. So what we'll build in here is what's called a factor of safety. We'll say that's the limit of what we can put on there, but just to be safe, we'll use a factor of safety of maybe two. In other words, we'll cut that in half just to double the margin we've got to uh, prevent failure. So uh, 
my calculations say I can put 122 kilograms on there, but I'm going to put into my plans and my recommendation to my boss who signs my paycheck, I'm going to say, fine, it could theoretically hold 122 kilograms, but I'm saying don't go over 60. You go over 60, don't come crying to me when it smashes your car flat because you put a lot of car spots on your head. I remember my car. Don't smash the boss's car flat. So, so we'll use a factor of safety in in uh, in most of the problems in strength of materials. Here we are designing to. Well, we're not actually designing anything. Here we're calculating right to the limit. Uh, what's the most mass we can put on here? Over that, we're not going to do. But under that, we're not going to worry. We'll assume we can take anything under that. But um, we'll assume that that's. Uh, true and hit right at it. But uh, the factor of safety will be very, very important to us in, uh, in uh, next term's class, class after this one. All right, so uh, let's redo this problem a little bit. And this will illustrate another thing that's real important to us. Very same problem, just going to change something a little bit and then use that to, to again do something that makes things a little bit more clear to us. Alright. Basically the same problem. What mass can be supported by a cable? Well, uh, you go down to Ace Hardware and ask for a cable with a tensile strength of 1200 newtons, uh, if you ask Earl, he'll be okay, because Earl's really smart. But if you don't, if Earl's not in that day, you have to talk to somebody else, they're not going to know what a newton is, because they think it's a cookie. So you're going to have to speak to them in English terms. So some of the problems we're going to do in here are in English units. So you could go in and say, yeah, I need a cable that can hold 270 pounds. And they know exactly what to do to help you out. So problem the same. It's the same free body diagram. Just since T 12,000 newtons, we've got T equals 20, uh, 270 pounds. But the diagram is the same. Everything comes out to be the same. So we'll get down to here that the weight must be, of course, the 270 pounds. That's what we had right here. But the problem asks for the mass. And you have, we don't have the mass. We have the weight. The problem asks for the mass. You know, we don't consider this to be any big deal, but we do have to make the calculation. So we have to solve for the mass. So that's 270 pounds over uh, G, which is, remember what it is in English units? 30, 32 to feet per second squared. Remember it's got the units of uh, acceleration on it. Oh, oh, um, uh, a negative sign in here because G is down. There's a no. What? You don't care? More than that, G is always. G is just a constant. The negative sign comes in the problem. Um, oh, I, I erased the one where you had T minus W. That's the negative sign. Or the implied negative sign here, the W is down because it'd be T minus W equals zero or T equals W. That's where the minus sign goes. That's the only place. No minus sign here on G, ever. If G needs to be negative, then it's got to be negative G equals negative 32 two. G is always positive. So this comes out to be, I think, 8.39. Now, 
here's where the English system of units gets about as stupid as it possibly can. And it strives to be stupid and succeeds gloriously at times. But this is one of the places when it's as stupid as possibly can be. Uh, if we just look at the problem, the units are, let's see, be pounds, that second squared on the bottom of the bottom, so that's the same as on the top. Uh, we have those for units, for the mass units. Now, there's no problem with that. There's not one part of that that you couldn't understand. However, because the English system of units is stupid and run by stupid people, this isn't good enough. We need to call that set of units something. So that is known as a slug. <laughs> so this is 8.39 slugs. It's 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 a, it's a stupid word. It doesn't help. Any. There's nothing we accomplish by going to that. Why not just stay here and be done with it? That's what I think, and that's what I'll do in our classes. This is fine. However, some of the problems, you need to know what a slug is. Well, that's what a slug is. It's one pound of weight accelerated at one foot per second squared. If you had that force, and that acceleration, you need a mass of uh, one slug. In this case, we have 8.39 of them, so it's 8.39 slugs. But I think that's gloriously stupid. So uh, I, I will not look for it uh, on the problems we do. However, that depends upon one thing. And Chris, I don't know if anybody heard what Chris just said. He kind of kind of highlighted on it a little bit. Um, what are you getting ready for? Class is over. Right <laughs> yeah, but we go to 11.05 and then you've got 10 minutes to get there. Oh, is it? oh I thought it was 55. No, no, we go to 11.05. We started at 10.10. We get 55 minutes, thank you very much. <laughs> so sit tight. Um, oh, this, de this depends upon one thing. And that's that in the English, you, in this class, and in dynamics class, forces in the English system are in pounds. If I say anything about pounds in a problem, you know that's a force. Because there's another unit of mass in the English system called the pound mass. And it's equal to 32.2 slugs. I think. I forget which because it's just as stupid. Um, so sometimes you'll see pound force as the unit for force and pounds mass as the units for mass. Which, again, highlights how stupid the English system of units is. The problem with, the, the reason all this happened is because in the English system the pound force was defined and separately the pound mass was defined and then they had to force them together to make a match. Whereas in the SI system, the mass was defined as the kilogram and then the Newton was defined from that. Not separately, but sequentially. So there's no conflict between the two. Here, there's a conflict between the two and it can be maddening. Uh, this is not very common anymore. Uh, well, the English system is not very common anymore. It's, it's kind of drifting out, thank God. Uh, but the pound force and the pound mass you might not see as often, but it's a 132.2 of a slug, which is awesome. So uh, all forces are in pounds in this class and in dynamics next year, and that's satisfactory for the units of mass in the English system far as I'm concerned. Because the thing is, if you have to solve for the mass, and we did this a lot in dynamics, where we had to solve for the mass and then use that to go find the acceleration or something like that. And so you just have to, if you make the conversion to slug, you just got to turn around and undo it anyway. So if you just stay here, you save yourself two steps, one down to slugs, one out of slugs, and let 
the fewer steps, the fewer chances for goofing up. And, and students will look for places to goof up as often as not. So, so we're trying to avoid places to goof up. All right. So for the most part, that's chapter one right there. So we're flying through this stuff. You haven't even bought your book yet, some of you, and we're already, it's already partially useless. So you should have bought it sooner and gotten your money's worth. Um, now what we're going to do is step back a little bit. I'm not sure why the book does it. If I was writing the book, I don't know that I'd do this, but the book does this. We need to very carefully make sure we can sum these forces right. So we're going to go over some of the trigonometry and the analytics of summing forces and the like. We're not going to worry about what the forces sum to other than to say they'll sum to some result. Now, in a week or two, when we get into this, the static equilibrium, and we've already done it a little bit here, that resultant has got to be zero. But for right now, we're just summing the forces for most of the problems. We're not worrying about, we won't have any unknown forces in this first, uh, the second, the second chapter where we're talking about the force vectors and the like. We won't have any that don't sum to zero. All we're doing is summing them. Uh, so we'll have all of them and uh, we'll know that they sum to zero. We're not even looking at that yet. We're just trying to sum the forces. So don't, uh, don't take this any farther for right now. All we're doing is. Now, since we're dealing with vectors, let's remind ourselves all vectors have how many things? Two. No. Three. You guys, who was your physics one teacher? He, he stinks, that guy. I'd go get your money back if I were you. I'd sue college, get your money back for physics one, because that's wrong. How many things do all vectors have? Huh? Three. three. Not two. Three. All vectors have three things. And they are. Magnitude is one of them. And that's, that's what this 270 is. It's the magnitude of that force vector. There's 270 of those things, not 271, not 260, 270. That's the magnitude. We need to know how big the force is. What, Bill? Sing it, dear. No, I'm trying to do the third. I can't do the third one. Uh, well, what's the second one? Direction. Direction. And we've already seen that a little bit. The, the uh, force in the cable is up. The weight was down. Those are very different vectors. They had the same magnitude because that's, uh, that's all we had in the problem. That was the whole setup of the problem. Those two things that have the same magnitude, that's the only way it wouldn't accelerate then. Uh, but they're very different forces. One's up, one's down. They're caused by different things. They're acting in different directions. They're very, very different things just simply because the direction between the two is different. Bill, did you come up with a third thing? Do you need to go get a hat? Could you borrow Alan's hat or does it have to be your hat? Bill can't think that he's not wearing a hat. I took her, took her in that a couple years ago. So I was very distressed when he came into class day without a hat on because I knew he wasn't taking this seriously. Alan, you have a hat on. What's the third thing? Uh, put your hat on backwards. See if that helps. You took dynamics. Same force. Same three things there. Same. Same. Whoever your physics momentum. one teacher was, whoever your dynamics teacher was. Momentum. Oh. No. Fiona, save these clods. Units. Units. You can't tell me this force is 270, that force is 270, and make me wonder is one pounds and one is newtons? Because those are very different. So you've got to have the newton, units. Uh, if you've got the magnitude, that's where the units are going to go. So 270 is the magnitude, pounds is the units. And then there's no question. So 
when we do problems in this class and I need a vector as an answer, I need those three things. However you do it is fine. And this one, uh, well, if we had the free body diagram here still, we'd have the W down. I know the direction. I know the magnitude. I know the units. You're done. Everything's there. You've given me all of those parts. Uh, we'll, we'll uh, of course, be using components of vectors in the x and y direction and in other directions. Uh, I need all three of those things in some way by some combination of those different uh, components and the magnitude and the direction of the components of a vector as well. That's one way. So we'll, we'll talk about all of those more on, uh, on Friday. Any questions? Okay, glad to see you.